Hello everyone and welcome back to Arctic Retro. So this is the first video I make in 2024, the previous one I made last year. So in this first video I thought I'll start a little bit easy. I'm gonna take a look at the Commodore 64 and it's been a while since I worked on a C64 so I can actually feel a little bit C64 cravings now. So yeah, let's take a look at this machine and see what it is about. As you can see, it's the boxed uh, Commodore 64 bread bin version, and uh, yeah, it's a little bit uh, scuffed up, a uh, lot of tape marks and uh, tear and wear, which is uh, quite usual on these old machines, uh, but uh, it's the inside that counts, isn't it? I got this machine as a donation from John a while back and I showed it briefly in a mail and donations video. And here it is and here you can see that it is not complete. <laughs> it's uh, missing the keyboard, it's quite uh, dirty, it's uh, missing a power supply. I have briefly tested it and it did actually power on but um, besides that I don't know the status of this machine and what needs to be done with it. However in this video I thought I am gonna fix it up and uh, yeah complete it. It has some damages to the case and uh, yeah things like that we need to take a look at. Yeah here you can see the back is uh, loose uh, that's uh, not uncommon on these cases. Uh, the fastenings here broken off and uh, needs to be fixed. And yeah, there's a, there's a user's manual. <laughs> this video is sponsored by PCBWay and I just want to say thanks to them for supporting my channel. As a hobbyist I uh, often find myself in the need of some PCBs for various projects. And of course PCBWay is my favorite the PCB manufacturer. Not only do they provide prototypes PCBs for reasonable prices and with uh, quite amazing shipping times, they can also provide you with other hobbyist needs like uh, advanced PCBs, PCB assembly, SMD stencil, CNC machining and 3D printing and various other products and capabilities. Also check out their shared project site where you can find a lot of ready-made designs for PCBs. So go ahead and visit pcbway.com to check out their services. Now back to the video. I don't know anything about the history of this machine, where it came from and uh, what has happened to it. Uh, yeah, dirty and a few uh, Scratches here and there, it has uh, made in England and uh, yeah, quite high uh, serial number, so nothing special about this machine. And yeah, it's missing uh, the side cover there, I think I have a spare. Alright, uh, I'm gonna take off the case and uh, take a closer look at the motherboard. All three screws are there. And uh, that's the motherboard and here you can see that uh, yeah, all three hinges here are broken off. Uh, luckily I have a method of fixing that, we're gonna take a look at that uh, later. So this is a 250-425 board and it says uh, copyright 1984. Yeah, it seems like uh, someone has done some improvements here from before, there's some heat sinks. None of the chips are in socket, uh, well except this one, this is uh, the PLA, I think. This is the SID, the CPU, uh, these are the three uh, ROMs and uh, CIA chips, memory chips here and uh, 
Yeah, it seems like uh, they have been using different brands on the memory chips. There are some LH and some NECs. And then you have this uh, soldered in uh, shield here for uh, the WIC 2 and the electronics are on that. Otherwise, everything looks to be original. Seems like the caps are the originals, uh, yeah. So I'm thinking maybe I'm gonna recap this uh, as well, just to have it done. Although it's very rare that the caps on a Commodore 64 is actually bad, but I still like to do it just as uh, some kind of future proofing. Assembled by Bremen. But obviously I need to uh, provide a keyboard to the machine and uh, I have a couple of spare keyboards. I just need to find one that is uh, working nicely. Yeah, and here's the keyboard. Uh, I don't remember where I got this from. I just had it lying around. Looks a little bit dirty. I might uh, take the keycaps off just to clean them up. Uh, yeah. Gonna hook this up and then we're gonna test the machine a little bit, maybe run some uh, diagnostics. Okay. I don't dare to use uh, one of the original power supplies anymore, even though I have a lot of those that are <laughs> measuring okay um, voltages. I still prefer to use this modern from Keylog. However, if you have an old uh, power supply brick from Commodore, you should consider getting yourself something like this. This is a C64 saver and this is a device that you plug between the power supply and the machine and this will save your machine if suddenly the power supply goes nuts and uh, <laughs> you get an over voltage on the 5 volt rail. This was actually designed by my friend BWAC and uh, made by Mindflare Retro. But for this one I'm pretty confident that it's safe. Alright, let's turn on the machine and see if it still works. Yeah, it does. And now we can see that this power supply delivers exactly 5 volts right now. that's Commodore basic and uh, yeah the picture looks kind of good I think it seems a little bit um, out of center uh, but I think that's because I adjusted my TV recently for another machine that uh, <laughs> was a little bit out of center let's test the keyboard then yeah seems to be working fine well you need to hit the keys quite hard at least some of them So seemingly there's no issues with this machine. It's kind of uh, boring, isn't it? Uh, you really wanted to see some repairs. Well, we'll see when I uh, do a full uh, diagnostics test, uh, if it's 100%. Uh, otherwise, this will be just a restoration and admiration video, I guess. So now I'm gonna run the full diagnostics. I got the uh, diagnostics uh, harness here which is all the dongles and the cables you need for a, a full hardware test and of course the diagnostics cartridge that has uh, the testing software you have probably seen this in use uh, before on my and other channels the diagnostics harness I actually built myself um, in a video a long time ago and uh, you can actually purchase this online. Uh, it has um, a dongle for the user port, the cassette port and this uh, termination plug here for the serial port and then it connects to the two control ports. And you can also use this uh, plug here for uh, the keyboard but uh, since we already know the keyboard is working I'm not gonna bother with that. And then obviously you just plug in the diagnostics cartridge. So let's run through this and see what uh, it says. To verify that the timers on the CIA chips are working, you can compare the two clocks here. They should be equal, which they are. So the RAM tests are okay. Color RAM we obviously can see is okay. PLA test is okay. 
one control port is uh, bad. Okay, that can mean uh, different things. It can mean uh, different chips or it can mean uh, the connection is not optimal. So the sound test, I didn't turn up the volume, so I need to wait for um, the second run. Yeah, SID chip sounds fine. Okay, so it says uh, U1 is bad and that is uh, one of uh, the CIA chips, which is not uncommon at all. Those chips are known to go bad. I have had several bad CIA chips uh, through the last years. Still, I'm gonna try to uh, disconnect and connect uh, the control port uh, connectors, just to see if that helps. I'm gonna spray a little bit of contact cleaner no, it still uh, comes out as bad. All right, then maybe we get ourselves a little repair job here after all. <laughs> actually need to do a real test with the joystick just to check that it is in fact bad. If you want to test control port 1, uh, you can actually just hook up a, a joystick and just uh, use it and you should see characters on the screen because it's shared with the keyboard. Yeah. So that one is working. An easy test of a control port 2 and control port 1 for that matter as well is to just peek the register for those two and control port 2 is 56 320 and this keyboard is terrible. Just make a small program here and then I, <laughs> I need to fix the keyboard. Okay, so now it shows uh, the value of the input for control port 2 and I can try and use the joystick. Yeah. Well. It up does not work. But uh, left, right and down and the button is working. So, okay, so we have an issue there with up. And I'm pretty sure this joystick is working. So either it's a connection problem or it's an um, issue with the CIA chip. But it uh, seems a little bit strange that just uh, one bit of that uh, register is faulty then. So here's another joystick. Let me test that one. No, nothing. Well, there it works. Okay, up works with this one. Strange. Hook up the first one again. Nope, I'm pretty sure this one did work before, but um, well, there. Yeah, it is actually working, just pressing a little bit harder. <laughs> okay, all right, so conclusion is both joystick ports work just fine, at least now. <laughs> so it could obviously be a contact issue with uh, yeah, dirty contacts or something. I'm gonna clean them really good in a while. Let me just do a little bit more testing before I continue. I've inserted the, the final cartridge uh, tree and um, yeah, let's see if that works. Yes, it does. And uh, with uh, that, you can control uh, the mouse pointer with a joystick. Yeah, yeah, that works just fine. So obviously there's uh, nothing wrong with uh, the joystick. Yeah. Nice. How about the game? This is the Donkey Kong. Yeah, works. Okay, the machine seems to be working 100%, uh, which is nice. Uh, however, since the keyboard is so bad, I'm gonna uh, work a little bit on that first. So that's my next step here. 
What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pull off all the keycaps, uh, clean it up a little bit, and then I'm gonna, yeah, remove this uh, back plate here. It has a lot of small screws. Actually, it seems like it has been done before. <laughs> so, but still, uh, this obviously needs some improvements. Uh, I'll see if I can improve it a little bit at least. Actually, you know what? Um, this keyboard looks quite clean after all. Uh, there's nothing under the keycaps. Just a little bit dust between the keys and uh, yeah, that's probably because it has been stored for a while here. I have uh, probably cleaned it up once before. So no point in taking those off. But I'm gonna take off this. For these screws, I have this handy electric tool. Just desolder the shift lock key. All right. So this is a Mitsumi keyboard, uh, well known, and it has this uh, carbon uh, keyboard contacts. And uh, yeah, you should be a little bit careful when cleaning these that you don't rub off that. Uh, carbon layer just gonna be careful and use a little bit of a contact cleaner and uh, wipe over them not too hard now each individual key has this uh, rubber pad that pushes down to the contact and i'm also going to clean off those a little bit with some uh, uh, ipa on a cotton swab just wipe them clean yeah you can see there's uh, some dirt but uh, yeah that might also just be some uh, <laughs> rubber coming off that was it quick and uh, easy cleaning uh, hopefully this helps if not then maybe this keyboard is uh, worn out and we need to use some other technique uh, to revive those uh, keyboard contacts let's see now did it improve not exactly Still need to push a little bit hard, but uh, maybe there's an improvement. Some keys are good, some are a little bit worse. Okay, I think I'll uh, go with this. It's uh, yeah, it's usable, but uh, you need to push a little bit firm. The next thing I'm gonna do is to clean off the motherboard. It's uh, full of dust, but uh, yeah, otherwise it looks alright. And the case, obviously, I'm going to take it down and clean it in the sink. Just going to do a simple uh, wipe off and uh, go over in between with some um, cotton swabs, some alcohol. I just like everything to be spotless. Then I just use the regular drill to clean all the contacts with some contact cleaner. The edge connector you can actually clean off with a, a rubber like this. It works uh, very well. But don't use uh, like uh, abrasive uh, tools like a fiberglass pen on these because then you remove uh, the thin layer of gold on uh, the edge connectors. have a missing uh, side cover here um, yeah I actually have a spare one here good to have some parts laying around I think this will uh, fit that fits very nicely 
nice, better with the original than a 3D printed one. Alrighty, next up, since I already have the board out, uh, I'm gonna replace uh, the electrolyte capacitors. Uh, there isn't many on this board, there's actually just three there, and this one, and four, and five. <laughs> On some uh, variants there are uh, several more, there's one there, six. If I have the correct values I'm gonna replace those. Probably not necessary for <laughs> some years more but still I wanna do it just to future proof it. I took off um, the shield for uh, the VIC-2, it's uh, 6569 R4, it's from 1985 and yeah, it has this simplified um, video and clock generation circuit so these are the caps and uh, one strange thing the 470 microfarad it's uh, rated at uh, 50 volts which uh, must be a little bit overkill i don't have a 50 volt i have a uh, 25 volts here and i see on other uh, motherboards that they have used the 25 volts so i think that's gonna be good so I'm just quickly gonna replace the caps and um, then I'll uh, be back afterwards. That was the recapping, quick and easy, a little bit different colors, blue and red, nice looking. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna place back the, the heatsink for uh, the week 2 chip, but just need a little bit uh, new heat compound there. Okay, that was uh, the motherboard I think. I was thinking about replacing the regulators but um, I decided to skip it. They are working fine so I don't think there's any need of uh, replacing those. I can always replace them if they fail. Let's do a little smoke test, see if it still works or if I <laughs> damaged it. Yep, still works. Nice. I'm gonna let it run for a while now, see if um, it's uh, stable and see if anything runs hot or anything. In the meantime, it's time to clean up this uh, rather uh, dirty case. And after that, I'm gonna see how I can fix um, the broken uh, um, clips here. For cleaning the case, I just use my regular method. I just spray with windows cleaner first. 
just let that work for a while and uh, scrub it a little bit and then I clean it off with some uh, hot soapy water. All right, the case cleaned up nicely and uh, yeah, perhaps it is a little bit yellowed. I'm not really sure. It's hard to tell on these gray uh, machines. Uh, anyway, yellowing can be fixed just by putting it out in the sun whenever the sun comes back. And in fact, today was the first day we saw the sun here in 2024 here in Buda. So we are celebrating a little bit. Sun is back. The sticker fell off during the cleaning, uh, fortunately it's just uh, some plastic or metal sheet so it's not damaged, just gonna glue it on. A little bit of uh, contact glue. Next up I'm gonna fix uh, the broken off clips and uh, yeah there are several methods to doing that but um, you need to uh, glue something on or replace the old clips with something that grips inside the grooves here. Maybe you can buy something or produce something yourself out of um, something metal or anything. I just uh, downloaded this 3D model from uh, uh, Thingiverse. So I'm gonna print a couple of those. Just gonna make a couple of uh, duplicates. So we need uh, three for one machine. Okay, that didn't go too bad. <laughs> At least I got five out of six. That 3D printer needs some. Uh, servicing. Uh, anyway, the clue is this goes into the uh, grooves here and on this side you glue them in uh, here. They fit just between there quite tightly. So the challenge here is to position them correctly so that they fit exactly into uh, the groove. So I just need to try and uh, adjust as uh, I see fit. So that one needs to go further down. Okay, I think it is a perfect fit now. Uh, yeah, the case top is not moving away from the bottom. It's a tight fit. So a little super glue. I'm not gonna take them off before I add some glue. I'm uh, hoping that the glue will uh, yeah, distribute between <laughs> the plastics here because if I take them off again, I will never get them right before the glue sets. Yeah, gonna let that dry and then I'm gonna strengthen it a little bit uh, even further with some epoxy. Okay, uh, there we go. So now I'm just gonna mix this. Yeah, just apply a little bit, not too much. Okay, that was it. I'm gonna let it uh, dry now for a couple of hours and then I'll be back and we can check if it fits. Motherboard is back into the machine looking great. A little bit of branding there. <laughs> I 
Okay, let's see now if this uh, keyboard and top cover case fits here. Yeah, looks like it is perfect fit. Not able to move anything here. Nice. Looking nice. So I think we need to test this machine a little bit further now that I'm done with it. I think we need to see if we can run some demos or games. I could of course use uh, the Kung Fu flash cartridge but uh, I really wanted to test that the disk interface uh, is working. I also have this SD2REC, that one is emulating a floppy disk drive, so I'm gonna test that one then. This one is just a simple version of that, that was quite cheap, it's just a 3D printed case and uh, yeah, the wires were just soldered directly there. I just added a little bit of uh, glue here to secure it. Yeah, so you just uh, insert this into the uh, floppy drive contact there. And uh, it also uses a micro SD card or SD card or whatever you have. Let's see if we can load something uh, from uh, this one then. Uh, yeah, of course it needs power, I forgot that. There are some variants of this that gets uh, power from uh, the cassette board. However, this does not that do that. I need a 5 volt supply here with a micro USB. Yes, loading. So there you have the content of uh, the root of uh, that memory card. So um, yeah, we need to go into uh, the correct folder to find some games. Now to change directory, you actually need to open a channel to the drive and uh, write a command for it, which can be a little bit uh, time consuming and difficult. So uh, yeah, it's probably better just to put your games and uh, programs directly on the root of the memory card instead. Something like that. Now we should have moved to that uh, directory I typed in the command uh, if I got it right, which I probably didn't, but uh, let's test. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, so I'm simply gonna move some games over to the root and we can run it directly from here. That's much easier. I'll just take the memory card out and uh, put it in the Windows machine. But you can also use a file browser program. This is called the File Browser 64. I mean, if you load that, you're able to uh, navigate the directory structure and select the D64 file you wanna use. So let's try here Saxon 2 and you can uh, either uh, quit now and run it uh, and load it uh, from basic or you can just select uh, the first file and run it directly from the file browser. Well it loaded, obviously cracked. <laughs> Wrong file name, sorry, no Saxon, all right. <laughs> so that's how it is with many of those uh, <laughs> downloaded games. <laughs> They don't work. They have uh, gone through some renaming and stuff uh, through the years and then suddenly stopped working. Uh, this might be some incompatibility issue with uh, ST2 IEC, obviously. I don't know. Let's try Super Mario then. I know I have loaded this one for uh, other machines before, so it should be working. Well, that seems to work. Well, I can't jump. 
up is not working. <laughs> well, we had that uh, in the beginning, so maybe there is some issue there. So I'm trying with another joystick, still the same. Up isn't working. So I thought this video was nearly over, but it seems like I need to investigate a little bit more about that um, joystick port. See if maybe in fact one of the CIA chips are uh, <laughs> damaged. My plan here was actually to sell this machine with the cassette player and the joystick. Uh, obviously then I need to make sure that it is uh, working properly. So it looks like the actual machine and the running software is working just fine. This is a demo, Utopia. That's kind of a cool uh, tune, sounds like a sample. Is that Sid sounds? <laughs> Just one final test before I take a look at uh, the joystick port issue. I'll see if I can load from cassette. This one I cleaned and tested okay in uh, May 22, uh, judging by the sticker there. Yeah, found turtles. <laughs> and this game requires a password, which you find in a code table, which I obviously don't have. I just have this empty box. However, Google is your friend and I actually found the table online. And let's see, A22, it's 11.46. Yay! <laughs> Well, isn't that amazing? Uh, tape still works after all these years. Well, that's kind of strange. No up works. <laughs> Maybe it's just an intermittent error. Look, up is working. Anyway, loading from tape works just fine, so that's good. Okay, so I had this running uh, yesterday for several hours and the uh, U1 was not bad and the joystick port worked. However, today <laughs> I tried to run the diagnostics again and now U1 comes out as bad, so, um, and I haven't touched uh, any of the cables or the diagnostics harness at all. Definitely it is a little bit intermittent error on the U1, I think. So I'm actually thinking about replacing it. However, I do not have a replacement CIA chip now. So I got to order one, but um, yeah. I think that will fix it, hopefully, uh, unless there's something else wrong here. <laughs> But uh, since the control ports are directly connected to the CIA uh, 1 chip, I think uh, it's uh, probably that one that is uh, the issue here. Yes, and now a little while later, you see there's no fault. So uh, maybe <laughs> when the chip heats up, it starts working. And when the machine is cold, it's uh, not because it's quite cold up here in the attic now. We actually have minus 12 degrees Celsius uh, outside now. So <laughs> anyway, I'm going to desolder the CIA chip and uh, try with another one from another working machine just to make sure that uh, it's the case. If we take a look at the schematics, we can see that both control ports has their joystick inputs going directly down shared with the keyboard connector uh, to U1 which is uh, CIA1 and uh, control port 2 goes here so that's uh, one of the PA input ports. So that will be uh, pin 2, 3, 4 or 5. And when the joystick uh, button is pressed um, the signal uh, goes low. So checking for continuity here, um, pin 2, 3, 4 and 5. Yeah, pin 2 is connected, pin 3 is connected, pin 4 is connected, 
pin 5 is connected, so um, no issues with the connections there. I mean, it could be uh, the contact itself, but um, it uh, actually looks uh, very nice. No, can't see anything wrong there, so... Yeah, I checked the pins on the outside as well, and they all are connected to um, the CIA chip. All right, I'm gonna desolder both the CIA chips, and uh, yeah, one thing you can do, since uh, they both are the same chip, you can swap them around, and uh, yeah, that way I can check if that fixes the problem, then, however, um, there will be an issue on the CIA 2 instead, but uh, yeah, maybe that pin is then not in use or something like that, so it could still work. Well, in fact, the same uh, port uh, on the CIA 2 is uh, used by the serial connection, so that's for the floppy disk drive. So if I've swapped them around, then probably uh, using floppy drive will be uh, uh, unstable, but we'll see. Okay, let me just do a quick uh, desoldering of uh, those chips and uh, I'm gonna solder in uh, sockets. A little bit of uh, flux. No, I think this was some of the easiest chip I have desoldered in a long time. They just came right loose right away. But that probably has to do with that I got a brand new uh, desoldering gun for my um, desoldering station. And the old one was apparently starting to fail, leaking. Alright, and that was the soldering, looking good. Just a little bit of cleanup. So now I'm gonna swap these chips. I label this one too and this one, so we switch them around. So, they sit firmly in there. Uh, okay, let's hook up uh, the diagnostics cartridge again and see if we see any difference. So if uh, chip 1 uh, has failed, then it should now uh, fail on chip 2. <laughs> well, I didn't destroy it at least, it's still working. <laughs> alright, everything's alright then. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to let it run and see if I can um, <laughs> get some error sometime later. Then I'll be back. So the motherboard has been running uh, now for yeah maybe almost an hour. Okay, it's 37 minutes if that's correct. And everything is okay, no errors at all. So I'm not really sure if there's an issue with that um, one CIA chip or not. 
that or if it was some connection issue. Yeah. <laughs> sure enough, it works. <laughs> I'm not very good at this. Why doesn't it jump further? Yeah, it was something to do with auto fire with this one. I can jump <laughs> normally. So I actually got the keyboard out again because uh, yeah, some of the keys uh, are very bad still and some even don't work at all like the run stop. <laughs> so I'm actually going to try and rub off um, a little bit of the rubber on the, each individual keyboard uh, key stem just to improve the conductivity and for that I actually need to pull off all of the keycaps. Luckily I got this puller here, that uh, is very helpful. If you use a screwdriver or something and try and uh, pry it out like this from the side, then you actually risk uh, breaking off uh, uh, the key stem. I have actually experienced that myself, so that's not a good idea. So you simply need a tool like this or something similar, or perhaps if you use uh, like two uh, screwdrivers you might be able to pull it off safely this might seem like a lot of work but it actually goes quickly taking this off is like five minutes and I estimate the rubbing of <laughs> the keys are uh, gonna take me half an hour or something yeah, it actually was kind of dirty underneath after all so now I get the opportunity to clean this off So these keyboard plungers, um, they have this rubber part here and that is actually made of conductive material. So if uh, that becomes uh, too high uh, resistance, then the key won't work. So I'm going to measure a couple of here. Supposedly it should not be more than uh, like four or five hundred ohms. Yeah, that's uh, 1.5 K ohms. So. Yeah, it's uh, way too high, I think. Yeah, you can see 2, 3K. So it varies a little bit, of course, how hard I push the, the probes. Let's see if we find one that's a bit better. 3K, uh, that was a little bit better. Okay, I have already cleaned those off with uh, alcohol and that did not help, but um, one thing you can do is try to rub them off on uh, a somewhat abrasive surface like uh, this paper. It's going to be a lot of work, but as you can see, it actually rubs off a little bit of uh, the rubber layer and thereby it uh, probably cleans it a little bit. Let me try and measure uh, this one then. Yeah, now it's just 200 ohms, so that might work. Okay, this one is over 2 uh, kilo ohms. Let me rub it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see now. Important not to get the fat from the fingers onto these, so I'm gonna try to avoid that. Yeah, now it's 300 ohms. Yeah, so I think this is gonna work. It's gonna be a lot of work, but um, yeah, I think there's over 100 <laughs> of these. All right, so I'm gonna do this on all, and then I'll be back to show you the result. All right, that didn't take too long. 
But actually I got this keyboard tester. It's a Commodore keyboard tester and it can test uh, different kinds of uh, Commodore keyboards. 64, C16, C128 and the 128D or SX64 and uh, yeah, I didn't think about that but uh, now I do. <laughs> So this one is quite a simple device. Uh, you just hook your keyboard up to it and connect it to a, a multimeter. Like so. And then the keyboard connector goes into here, the correct one. And this simply just measures um, the resistance when you press the keys. So uh, 14 ohms uh, with no keys pressed well. Obviously you need to um, put the springs and the keys uh, back because uh, without those all the plungers are down. So I need to do that first. Keyboard is assembled so now we have uh, open line and uh, yeah let's check some keys the run stop didn't work at all ah 100 ohms 117 100 yeah this looks promising just gonna check all the keys and see that they are good and then i'll be back Yes, all keys uh, were below 200 ohms and I didn't push hard at all. If you push really hard, then obviously the, the resistance goes down. No, I'm pushing really hard and I'm down to 93. So my hopes are high, this keyboard is going to work better now. Oh yes, I'm barely touching the key and uh, everything is working. Let's see a run stop that didn't work. Yeah, that works. <laughs> so that was an effective method. I haven't used that before, but uh, I got a tip on the Commodore 64 128 Facebook group, in fact, uh, to try this. And yeah, this worked amazingly good. Nice. Well, this became a long video. <laughs> So I'm gonna end it uh, here and now. Uh, I actually tested a little bit more the next day, which is today. And uh, yeah, there's actually some issue with loading from a floppy disk as uh, I suspected because of a bad CIA chip, no move to the other spot. <laughs> so I'm actually gonna order a CIA chip and uh, yeah, see if I can uh, replace it and hopefully that will fix it. But otherwise this machine works just just great. So thanks a lot for watching and uh, thanks a lot for any likes and uh, subscribes. And a special thank you goes to my patrons. See you later. Bye bye.